Good morning and welcome to St. Columns. For those of you who are with us in Hawthorne and for those of you who are watching online, it's great to have you with us this morning. Just a reminder that we do still live in a COVID world, so we ask that uh, you will respect those who need a little more distance and we appreciate that. We are the week after Easter. Last weekend, we celebrated the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And at the end, or towards the end of John's Gospel, we heard last week that Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And of course, he is risen. And we're going to begin this morning in our worship by singing two songs, but the first one really reflects on the life of Jesus as we remember his life and his victory. So let's stand and sing, see him in Jerusalem. Yeah, 
We've just sung about the life, the death and the resurrection of Jesus, the victory that Jesus, our Lord, had over death. We're now going to continue with this theme and sing, looking forward, Behold, the tomb is bare. Please be seated. We've just sung about the victory that Jesus had by rising from the dead, by defeating death. And so we can come to our Lord God knowing that there has been victory and that our sins are forgiven if we come before him with humility and ask in repentance. So will you please join with me in saying together the words on the screen. Heavenly Father, you have loved us with an everlasting love, but we have gone our own way and broken your laws. We are sorry for our sins and turn away from them. For the sake of your Son who died for us, forgive us, cleanse us and change us. By your Holy Spirit, enable us to live for you and to please you more and more through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now God desires that no one should perish, but that all should turn to Christ and live. In response to his call, we have acknowledged our sins and God pardons those who humbly repent and truly believe the gospel. Therefore, we do have peace with God through Jesus Christ. Amen. Now we come to our teaching time for all of us. And shortly, Jessica will give us our all-age talk and Mark will then speak from John's Gospel. But as we come to the Lord's work, word, let's pray together these words. O Lord, Heavenly Father, 
in whom is the fullness of light and wisdom. Enlighten our minds by your Holy Spirit and give us grace to receive your word with reverence and humility, without which no one can understand your truth. For Christ's sake. Amen. So, come on down, Jessica and the kids. Hi, Carol. <laughs> um, so we'll start with, so when you're told a really crazy fact, do you believe it straight away or do you sometimes need it to be proved? I couldn't hear you. <laughs> Good to have proof, yeah, like a quick Google or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, if I told you that a hippo's jaw can open wide enough to fit a sports car inside, would you believe that? <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Like, if it was a toy car, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, or if I told you there was once a man who had a chicken who laid a perfectly square egg. Yeah. So, these kinds of facts often sound sort of believable, but we're just not sure if it's true or not. Yes, Hugo? If the chicken was square. <laughs> I don't know. I think that's something you would have to see to believe, right? Um, so, <laughs> so some of these facts we would have to see to believe, but others we might um, like to believe it anyway, even if it probably isn't true. So, in today's Bible reading, we hear about how Jesus appeared to a group of his disciples after he came back to life, but a guy called Thomas wasn't there with them, so when all his mates told him about it after, he just couldn't believe it, not until he saw and touched Jesus himself. So, this is why he's sometimes called Doubting Thomas, which is kind of an unfair nickname, because he had doubts that the story of Jesus' resurrection um, really happened. So even though Thomas had seen Jesus perform miracles, even saw him raise someone from the de dead, Thomas just couldn't believe what he couldn't see with his own two eyes. Or maybe he just didn't trust his friends enough. Um, so all that changed when Jesus returns again because Thomas's faith was transformed the very moment he saw Jesus. And Jesus offered Thomas exactly what he needed in order for him to believe without Thomas even needing to say what he needed. So this story shows us how Jesus is always gentle with us, even when we doubt and when we get confused. So over the past few Sundays, we've seen how all the disciples needed different things to believe. Peter had to deny God first, Mary needed him to call her by her name, and Thomas needed some hard evidence of God. But however we come to a firm belief, God understands just as Jesus understood his disciples. Jessica's given us a little clue as to what the Bible reading is all about. So Carol is now going to give us the reading uh, from John chapter 20 and then Mark will speak to us. Sorry, sorry. Okay, so the reading is from John chapter 20, starting at verse 19, and you can find this in the Church Bibles on page 1089. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, 
I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now, Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We've seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is the word of the Lord. Well, if we imagine that this was what we did during Lent, here's Easter, and then these post-resurrection narratives are on the other side, for all of uh, Lent, we looked at the farewell discourse in John's Gospel. And in John's Gospel, Jesus, from uh, chapter 14 onwards, is actually saying to his disciples all the things that he wants them to finally get before he goes to the cross, and so he promises all these things. He promises that uh, after the resurrection, their sadness will turn to joy, that they will experience peace, that they'll go on the mission, and that they'll receive an advocate and a counsellor. And now, today, we live on the post-resurrection side, and this account in John's Gospel is John giving to us how Jesus has fulfilled all those promises that happened before the cross. So Jesus comes into their presence and says, peace be with you. He doesn't say, where were you at the cross? How come you abandoned me? Peter, what are you doing? He doesn't say all those things. No, he promised that they would abandon him, but that he would still bring them peace. And so he begins with, peace be with you. He promises them that they'd have an advocate to go on this mission that he was going to send them, he comes and sends them on this mission and brings the Holy Spirit, the Advocate, the Counsellor. This is John's account where he's giving them the post-resurrection narrative and there are some differences but John, John says there are many, many things that he could have written. So, you must think, well, if there are many things that he could have written and he could have filled volumes of books, why did he write these particular things? He's given us a particular account. It's a little different to Matthew. Matthew has the Great Commission. Here, it's kind of almost subtle that Jesus sends them on the mission. Luke, in Acts, has this grand kind of Pentecost. And and here... John has a very subtle kind of breathing, and I'll get to that in a minute. And the Holy Spirit comes. This is his post-resurrection account, and, and it's here for a reason. He's given particular things for a reason, so let's unpack those, reading, those reasons. Well, Jesus, in John's Gospel, appeared to Mary, and in the resurrection account, it's, it's Mary that's told to go and share this good news with the disciples. But we get the impression from John that they heard the news and perhaps didn't believe it, because they're 
in the upper room or in a room and they're closed all the doors and they're in hiding. Perhaps they're in hiding out of sight of both the Jewish leaders who were trying to persecute this fledgling group, but maybe they're also hiding from the Romans who were maybe, maybe they thought they would be the next ones to be crucified in a very public way. And so they're fearful and they're hiding. And Jesus comes into their presence and appears to them in his full resurrected form. Notice he doesn't come to them as a ghost. He doesn't have some kind of spiritual connection with them. This is not them meditating on on sort of connecting with Jesus. No, Jesus comes in a physical resurrected form to them. And Jesus said, when I come to you, you will have your sadness will turn to great joy and here the disciples have great joy as Jesus had predicted. Their weeping and their sadness as they realise that Jesus is alive turns to great joy. And this is kind of like one resurrection appearance. It's Notice it's like a week later they're in the same room and this time Thomas is with them. And it's in the Thomas conversation that we confirm Jesus is a physically resurrected body. Because if they were just meditating and they were just sort of praying and somehow connecting with Jesus on the spiritual realm, why would Jesus say, well, touch my side and touch my hands? He wouldn't do that if he's just having a spiritual connection in heaven connecting down to the earth. So the fact that he says, here's my wounds, if you want to still doubt, you can touch me physically. That's John's way of saying and reminding people that Jesus appeared in the physical form. The resurrected Jesus is a full resurrected body in a physical way. And so the Thomas account here in John's Gospel is given to us by John for a very important purpose because it reminds us that in the Gospel of John, John wants his readers to know that this is a full physical resurrection. And therefore, we can put our faith and trust in Jesus because He resurrected as He promised He would. But John, again, has selected all of these things for a purpose. There are many other things, he says, that he could have put into his book, but but why this account? Why did he put the story of doubting Thomas there? I mean, some people say, like, the disciples made all this up afterwards. If you made it up afterwards, what would you put in there that one of the disciples was doubting? Wouldn't you have written that out? Like, wouldn't you have sort of said, no, some of us doubted, no, no, no. You'd say, all of us believe this from the very earliest days. You wouldn't put an account in there of someone doubting. But I wonder why John puts this in. I wonder why John puts the account of doubting Thomas as Jessica shared with us. Well, we might read the story and we might call him the doubting one, but at some point all of us have doubted. At some point all of us have not believed or wanted more proof. Thomas gets his name because, uh, the doubting Thomas, because not only did Mary tell the disciples and the other disciples didn't believe, but when So, Thomas has heard Mary's testimony and didn't believe Mary. Then, for some reason, he's out of the room and Jesus appears and those disciples, but then he doesn't believe them. So, he's heard two eyewitness accounts of the resurrected Jesus and he still doesn't believe. He wants further proof. He wants to have some kind of physical representation of the things that he's seen. Maybe, as Jessica pointed out in the kids' talk, He'd seen things happen for real. Maybe he wanted to see it physically again just to prove that it was true. But notice that when Thomas does get proof, he says, my Lord and my God. When Thomas does get proof, he has a zeal for the Lord and he proclaims the Lord as God. But I want us to know that doubting Thomas, it's not a person out there. It's not some kind of 
people we, we can look at in society and say, yeah, they're Doubting Thomases. No, Doubting Thomas is actually an archetype in here. We are all got some part of the Doubting Thomas inside each one of us. There are all moments in our life where we, 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 we're kind of praying to God and we say, God, would you show us a greater sign? Would you give us more proof? Would you, would you make yourself known in even greater ways? We, we all demand greater proof from God before we step out in faith. There are times where we're like Doubting Thomas, where we think that we're being called by God to step out in faith into something and we say, God, just give us one more sign and, and, and it's almost like God says, okay, here's one more sign and then we say, yeah, that was a good sign but would you give me one more sign that that's the right decision? Would you have one more person tell me that this would be a good decision? We put our faith and trust but we want one more sign, one more sign of proof. It just shows that there's a doubting Thomas in each one of us. We might feel that there's somebody in our life and they say, would you pray for me? You know, I need some healing in my life. Would you pray for that healing? And we're kind of like, yeah, yeah, we'll pray for you. But in the back of our mind, we're kind of like, yeah, I don't know whether, you know, I still doubt whether God heals people in that way. Or perhaps we feel like we we know that in this post-COVID world that there's a new season that we're being called into, but we're kind of like, well stepping out into a new season is just too much hard work. I don't really know what it looks like, it's just easier to go back to the old thing. There's a doubting Thomas in each one of us. We're perhaps just like Thomas. We want more proof. We want another sign. We want another person to confirm what we know to be true, but we just don't have the faith to step out. But perhaps we're also like Thomas in that when we do get that proof, we do get that sign, we have a boldness where we can step out in faith and zeal, like Thomas did when he said, my Lord and my God. But there is a difference, isn't there, between Thomas and us? And there's a hint of why we're different to Thomas in the beatitude that Jesus gives here, the final beatitude of Jesus. Jesus had talked many, blessed are they who, dot, 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 they're called the Beatitudes and Jesus gives one final one here and to the disciples, all the other Beatitudes were things that had given at the Sermon on the Mount and they were kind of about the Kingdom of God in the world. Here is a Beatitude that points forward to the mission that they're about to go on and Jesus says, blessed are those who do not see and yet believe. We're in that group, the blessed group that Jesus gives to His disciples, we're in that group. Thomas was waiting to the day where he could physically touch Jesus. We could never wait for that, could we? There's no way that we could ever just wait, well, just show me some physical proof of being able to touch Jesus and give Him a hug or just touch His scars, then we'd believe. We could never ever wait for that proof, could we? So, in a way, Jesus is saying to His disciples, you think you're blessed because you saw me physically. And, and the reason we sort of say apostles, we, we call a certain group apostles, it's because they physically saw and heard Jesus teach and perform miracles. But that generation died out when Jesus ascended to heaven and it was the Holy Spirit that was left to bring people to faith in Jesus but they couldn't rely on physically seeing Jesus. And so Jesus points out that blessed are those who have faith, but do not see. You might have heard this described as walking by faith and not by sight. That we walk in faith, not because we see Jesus physically, not because we somehow see the the very physical way in which Jesus performed miracles. But we see in faith. We believe in faith. And that's a real blessing. Jesus says, in a way, we are more blessed because we believe, because we believe in faith, not because we have some kind of uh, proof in the fact that we've touched Jesus. 
But in a way, as much as we might think we're the blessed generation, there's still a whole lot of doubting Thomases in the church, isn't there? You know, a doubting Thomas in the church will say, well, you know, it's not like the good old days, people are walking away from the church, there's not as many people in the church anymore. But then Jesus says, blessed are those who see in faith a growing church, a church where more people would come to faith in Jesus. And there are people, there are leaders in our church today that see a growing church. Not by sight, but in the vision of faith, they see a church that's growing and expanding and more people putting their faith and trust in Jesus. There are doubting Thomases in our world who say, well, you know, the miracles were great in the Old Testament, the miracles were great in the time of Jesus, but we don't see miracles like that anymore. And Jesus says, blessed are those who see miracles by faith and pray for healing by faith. A doubting Thomas will say, well, we can't just do those things anymore because the church is under attack. But blessed are the ones who by faith see a church that's transforming our society for the better. You know, we can see examples of people who are walking by faith all the time in our society if we look for it. If we want to see the things that the Doubting Thomases are pointing us to, we can see those as well, can't we? We can see signs all around where the church is in decline or it's not working as well as it used to be. But one of the great examples that I think even just on our own doorstep, I was uh, at St Hilary's on staff and, and Peter Caroline who was a minister at, at, at St Hilary's, just saw a vision of faith, saw that there were, uh, uh, people, people were telling him all the time, oh, the inner city, we don't need churches in the inner city anymore because people don't go to church in the inner city. And he thought, no, that's not true. And he had a vision in faith of a church vibrant in the inner city and he had a vision for a church in Merry Creek in Clifton Hill area and he planted that church and that church is thriving. And then he saw an Anglican church that had been converted into a yoga studio in the main street of Fairfield. And he had a vision that, what if, instead of people knowing that as a yoga studio, what if people knew that as an Anglican church again? And this year, by faith and by vision, they've replanted an Anglican church in that church in Fairfield. And so now we have, by faith, what people saw physically as a yoga studio, by faith, we now have Merry Creek Anglican Church in Fairfield. If we look by faith and see by faith what's possible, we mightn't see it physically in sight, but we'll see it by faith. And we need to be people who see things by faith and walk by faith, not by sight. And if we walk by faith and not by sight, then we too will be blessed. It might be hard if we think we have to do it on our own. But Jesus gives us the Holy Spirit. Jesus breathes on His disciples here in this passage and gives them the Holy Spirit. We, we'll get to Pentecost. We're going to celebrate the Feast of Pentecost in a few weeks' time. and We'll talk about the miraculous outpouring in the book of Acts of the day of Pentecost. But here, John's account because John goes from the Gospel of John right through to Revelation, he kind of gets to the end times. So before John finishes his Gospel, he wants to get in there that the Holy Spirit is coming. And so he has this account where Jesus breathes on them and gives them the Holy Spirit. In the original language, and again, you don't need to understand the original language, I don't really speak the original language either, But in the original language, this is a direct parallel of the book of Genesis, where Jesus breathes on them and they come to life in the Holy Spirit. And in the book of Genesis, God breathes on Adam and he comes to life. It's a direct parallel because perhaps John is using the same image, the same wording, because he wants the readers to know that this group of disciples who are hiding in the upper room and fearful of the Jewish leaders, fearful of the Romans, when they have the Holy Spirit, they come to life. This mission that they were too daunted by, they come to life when they have the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus breathes on them the Holy Spirit, and these disciples who were weeping and afraid now understand the meaning of the resurrection and can go out on this mission. 
Now, we'll have to still wait for the day of Pentecost, which happens 40 days after this, where there's a miraculous outpouring of the Holy Spirit and 3,000 people give their life to Christ, but we'll talk about that on the day of Pentecost. This is a foretaste, so that when the day of Pentecost comes, the disciples already knew what the Holy Spirit would do, and therefore they already knew what to interpret when they see the day of Pentecost. So, I wonder what is coming at St. Columns. I wonder what we see by faith at St. Columns. I've been thinking a lot about what might be coming at St. Columns. I've been thinking a lot about what we might see in faith. I've been thinking a lot over these last couple of weeks and in a way, I don't quite see what's coming next. It's not like I could give you a strategic plan and tell you right now, this is what's going to happen in, in the next few months at St. Columns. But what I do know and what I do hear as I talk to a lot of you is that we're all aware of the fact we can't just turn the clock back to 2019 and pick up from there. It's like there are some people who were hoping that if, if 2019 was a road, people kind of was like, we just parked the car we did two years of COVID and we get back into the car and we keep driving from where we started. No, it's like the car was picked up and transported to a completely different highway and we have to start from there. So, we have to understand where we're starting from in order to work out where we're going. And so, I've been thinking about where we are and where we're going and I can't give you a strategic plan but I just know, I just know by faith that God is doing a new thing. I just know by faith that this mission that Jesus sent the disciples on in this upper room in John's Gospel, that's the same mission. The mission hasn't changed. We're still to go out and make disciples of all the nations. The Holy Spirit is still going to empower us like it empowered these disciples. But the methods are going to change. The methods are going to adapt to the world in which we live. And we have to, by faith, continue the mission that Jesus set us to walk on. This mission that for centuries has continued as people continue to make more disciples of Jesus. We have to know that that's going to continue. When Jesus said He would continue to build His church, we have to trust that that's going to happen. So, we have to walk by faith and not by sight. And I'd encourage us to all think about that in coming weeks. I was talking to somebody this week, it wasn't a youth pastor that I know personally, but they were talking about how after two years of lockdowns, just the mental health issues amongst young people is really a problem. And they were saying to me that this youth pastor was saying that young people just seem to be looking for answers in a way that that this youth pastor hasn't seen for a while. Now, this youth pastor knows that it's Jesus that's the answer to that. Well, I think it would be wonderful if by faith we could see a way where we might carve out how we might answer that question for young people in this area. How, how could we in Hawthorne help young people in this area, an area that's full of private schools, full of great schools, a university across the road, how could we help those young people find meaning? Meaning that's been thrown and tipped up as the property market has gone crazy, as COVID has, has changed a whole lot of things. But Jesus is the same. The resurrection is still good news. How by faith could we walk in that? Again, I just see, by faith, more people coming to know Jesus. I'm part of a group in the Anglican Church that we're, we're, we're praying for revival in the church. It's, it's, we, we, we're launching a, a new initiative called the Anglicans for Renewal and we're praying that we would see revival in our day in the church. Because by faith, we're just not saying, well, the church is in decline and we just have to put up with it. No, Jesus said He would build His church and by faith, we just have to look at for that. I think all of us would much rather 
walk by faith and not by sight. Perhaps some of us, and me included, need to close our eyes just for a while and look at these buildings and look at the places and spaces that we've got and not see what we physically see now, but just close our eyes, not because we're blinded to the reality, but see with the eyes of faith what God could do in this space. Imagine more people coming to know Jesus in our area. Recently, we were talking about the cafe and some of the experiments we're doing with 6pm. And uh, someone said, well, what happens when, like, what happens when 6pm gets too big for the cafe? Will we move back to the church? And I love um, Pam and Ian Campbell. They said, that's the type of problems that we want to have. That's faith, isn't it? I love the story of our barbecue. Someone knew that the barbecue needed replacing and, and, and someone thought, well, let's just get a cheap barbecue. And someone by faith, and I won't dob them in in case they don't want anyone to know that they paid for it. But by faith, they said, no, let's get the biggest barbecue that we can have because one day we're going to need to put more sausages on the barbecue. It's little signs of taking a step by faith something that we don't see in reality. But just like Jesus encouraged through the Holy Spirit for the disciples to walk by faith, we need to walk by faith. There's a great song that I used to sing in another ministry, in another life. Not another life, not reincarnation life, I just, you know what I mean. <laughs> Please don't think that I was saying reincarnation. But when I was in youth ministry, that's a better way to say it. When I was in youth ministry, we used to sing this song, I think it was by Chris Tomlin. And the words were, greater things are yet to come. Greater things are yet to be done in this city. And I still believe that. And I still believe that for Hawthorne. So let's pray that greater things are yet to come and let us walk by faith and not by sight. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, would you come? Would you come and would you guide us? Would you steer us where we need to go? Would you give us a vision in our faith of things that you see? Lord, there's a doubting Thomas in each one of us. So, Holy Spirit, would you come and remove our doubt? And just like when Thomas had the proof that he needed, he had a zeal for you. Lord, would we have a zeal for the mission that you're calling us to? And would you help us to walk by faith and not by sight? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mark has encouraged us to walk by faith and to let the Holy Spirit work in us for the Lord's glory. So please stand and sing, and sing prayerfully. Holy Spirit, living breath of God, breathe new life into my willing soul. Let's stand.
Please be seated as Lisa continues to lead us in prayer. Today we pray. We come before our loving God whose life, death and resurrection is what we have been celebrating as the greatest news of all. We take a little bit of time to quiet our thoughts, we quiet our hearts for a moment, here together on this Sunday morning at St Columns Community, encouraged by our fellowship and ready to receive all the gifts that the Lord has for us as we gather today. We listen for God's presence. God, we acknowledge you as our saviour, here among us by the power of your Holy Spirit. Guide us always as to how we should follow you courageously, faithfully, by sight, always with trust and hope. Help us to contend with our doubts. Lord, hear our prayer. Inspire each of the ministries of St. Columns to respond to your call, reflect your character and deliver your harvest. We pray this week for the playgroup and all the beautiful kids, parents, grandparents, volunteers in playgroup. May they just have a tremendous time in your presence, God. We pray for Kareva and all the very real and present hope and help that Kareva gives to people who seek its care. Bless those counsellors uh, with your presence. And we also pray for your presence within all of the small groups of our church, that these be places of real growth, real transformation, real friendship and real love. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for all the people whose lives will cross each of our paths this Easter season old friends, neighbours, colleagues, family, new acquaintances. Grant each one of them a glimpse of the kingdom. Rescue them, heal them, love them through our witness, empowered by your grace, Jesus. Lord, hear our prayer. For an end to world conflict, for the safety of citizens, for compassionate leadership in government, for workplaces, for business leaders, for volunteers, for love to lead those in authority. Lord, hear our prayer. For all who are sick among us today and all who have requested our prayers, we pray and we hold them in our hearts and hand their needs over to you, God. Lord, hear our prayer. And this beautiful prayer from the Anglican Prayer Book, Lord of all life and power, who through the mighty resurrection of your son overcame the old order of sin and death to make all things new in him, grant that we, we being dead to sin and alive to you in Jesus Christ, may reign with him in glory, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be praise, honour and thanksgiving, now and for all eternity. Amen. And together we say the Lord's Prayer. 
Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Now, uh, three notices to uh, share with you uh, this morning about the activities and what's going on around St Columns. The first one, now there's a familiar face for some of you. Uh, Peter Horsford has been around St Columns, I'm going to say decades, that's absolutely true. I'm not, three decades, four decades, it's a long time. Uh, four? <laughs> three, we'll go three. Um, he started the cricket ministry in the big hall that is still going after many years. We're farewelling Peter and Prisk for a period. We're saying thank you to Peter. Next Sunday, um, the 1st of May, uh, barbecue, already mentioned in the sermon, uh, at 4.30 and uh, a service and uh, a thanksgiving and uh, more details. Tanya's right here if you want to know more details about what's happening on Sunday. Uh, more details on e-news uh, to RSVP um, and to donate to a gift towards Peter. So uh, that'll be a great thank you to Peter next Sunday. Before, uh, on, not, not after that, the following Tuesday, live from HTB in London, Holy Trinity Brompton, um, they have a leadership conference, 6pm our time, which I've worked out if my maths is right, is about 9am London time, um, that day, um, anyone is welcome. Uh, the live stream it goes from 6 till 8.30, so join us from 5.30 in the cafe. Mark will be there from 5.30. Uh, not restricted just to some columns. If you've got other people who want to uh, join us and pop in for the cafe, 6 to 8.30, everyone is welcome, but bring 10 bucks and you can have pizza for dinner. So um, that will be a great learning time if you can make it for, from 6 p.m. And the third announcement is uh, the coffee cart. Well, it's coffee in the cafe. Uh, we're going to do this, uh, we did it this morning, the next three uh, Sundays in May from 9.30 p.m. before church starts. Pop in there for... Sorry? Oh, not p.m., a.m. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Just to make sure you're awake, Pete. <laughs> uh, from 9.30 a.m. next Sunday and for the next three Sundays, which includes Mother's Day, uh, pop in before the service, catch up with people and then join us for service at 10 o'clock. Now, our final uh, song this morning is uh, our car I Cast My Mind. And as we sing this song and as we reflect on Jesus, you'll see in the wording of the song as we remember what Jesus has done, we end up by, oh, praise his name. And so let's stand and sing to praise the name of our Lord Jesus.
It's been wonderful to sing praises to the Lord our God in that song. Mark reminded us, in fact, the very last verse of the passage this morning, John wrote, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. We do have life in his name. So as we conclude the service, let's say together, Lord Jesus Christ, send us out with confidence in your word to tell the world of your saving acts and bring glory to your name. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen.